Okay, so we will move to our third uh, speaker, which is uh, now going to Israel and to my colleague, Ali Arorak. Thank you. Hello and uh, Shalom from Tel Aviv. My name is Ayelet, Ayelet Oreg, and I'm happy to be part of this interesting day. So thank you uh, for inviting me. And today I will share my experience using digital ethnography and visual data analysis in my um, studies about Milton, Milton Nation. Um, so what is digital ethnography? Um, traditionally, ethnographies involve the exploration of social phenomena in the field. And as ethnographers, we listen to, we observe, and we directly communicate uh, with the subject of, of, their, of our, our research. And uh, we can look at ethnography as the art of storytelling. Story um, and the data is collected through human interaction. Um, however, with the development of new technologies um, and uh, social media, uh, the way in which storytelling is done today is a little different. So um, digital ethnography has emerged as a new approach uh, to conducting ethnographies. And the method uh, is situated under the paradigm of uh, interpretism, and it aims to capture cultural and social experiences in a holistic manner um, through social media and other digital platform. I will not elaborate on it because I know that later on today you're going to talk about it. Um, so I'll just go straight to my, my work. Um, so I never planned on ima or, or imagined that I will study um, milk donation. Um, my journey of studying human milk donation started by a chance. Um, after an encounter with a post on my Facebook of a bereaved mother who donated her human milk in memory of her dead baby. So I was deeply touched by the story and by the mother's act of kindness. And I decided to explore the phenomenon of human milk donation to nonprofit milk banks after prenatal loss. Um, as a social worker with years of experience working with bereaved families and as a researcher who studies um, philanthropic giving, my study aimed to uncover the following questions. What role does male donor identity play in mothers coping with loss? To what extent does it extracting and donating milk become a ritualistic process? And how is the ritual of milk donation intertwined with the grieving process? So here is a little bit about the data that I um, collected. So given that it all began on Facebook, I decided to carry on the study online. So my aim in the study was to uncover bereaved donors' experience, motivations, and identities. Uh, I chose all Facebook pages of nonprofit milk banks that are associated with the Human Milk Bank Association of North America. Um, this would be the unit of my analysis. I had 28 Facebook pages at the time. And I just began following them. Uh, in the first few months, I observed all the materials that appeared on my Facebook newsfeed and walls, sweet pictures of adorable babies um, and their proud mothers, happy families, close of milk banks, um, staff, and tons, tons, tons of milk banks. Um, and once in a while, there was a sad post of a bereaved mother telling the story of her dead baby and sharing her wish to donate her milk in commemorating, uh, in commemoration of her baby. Um, so I saved those pictures in a special folder. And later on, I expanded my exploration to include past Facebook posts that, uh, that had been published since 2010. Um, in addition, I started following online public blogs of bereaved mothers who lost their um, babies to prenatal loss or miscarriages. Uh, and I chose and, and chose to donate their milk, obviously. And I watched personal um, YouTube memorial YouTube videos that parents who lost their babies and again donated their milk uploaded on YouTube. Uh, so I used all this material to better understand the experience of prenatal bereavement and the role of milk donation within those experiences. Um, so as you can see from this sweet picture. So the Facebook pages I followed in my study were all public. So like this kid, I was a passive observer. So at this stage of my research, I didn't contact any of the mothers or the post. I didn't, I didn't 
click like or I didn't leave any comment. I was just observing, you know, lurking, okay, from the outside. Um, and then within a year, um, I collected almost 100 posts and blogs entries written by bereaved donors, um, all in between the years uh, 2010 and 2018. Um, of these, I focused only um, on stories that included rich content about bereaved milk donors, motivations and experiences. So from all the 100 materials that I had, I, I, I did all kind of selection. I had a selection criteria. Um, that were, I, I looked for stories that has um, the story of the pregnancy, the story of the birth, story of the loss, the story of the beginning of the lactation and the donation process, and then the last uh, donation and, and the farewell, as, as we call it, the, I call it, the farewell from the last milk bag and that was donated. So I'm, I analyzed all the materials based on um, grounded theory and I coded um, recurring Themes. Um, okay, so in the second phase of my study, um, my, my digital ethnography um, shifted from passive observer to an active researcher. Uh, I contacted mothers via Facebook Messenger, I introduced myself, and I invited them to participate in my study and um, share their experiences. Um, I did it either through um, messenger or email or through, um, and I invited them to also interview via Skype. Um, I also contacted the uh, mothers who left their contact information in their public blogs. Um, and some, some others ignored my messages, obviously. Um, some said that the loss and the milk donation occurred a few years ago and that they prefer not to talk about it, which is understandable. Of course, um, but luckily there were few mothers who agreed to be interviewed. Um, keep in mind that um, this kind of sample um, or this sample is is one of the study's limitation uh, because I have only the experiences of mothers who published um, in some way or another their grieving experiences online. Okay, so I have no way to learn about the experiences of those who donated milk and didn't share it online. Um, so I think it's in general it's a limitation that is probably exists with, with any other um, digital ethnography work. So when I think of today's theme, for me, qualitative research that matters is mostly about researchers' ethics and about doing research that is also empowers the people you study and make their voices heard and make your research be part of a social change. And most of all, to always, always uh, stay humble. Um, and remember that we tell a story that is someone else's life and somebody else's story. Um, so when interviewing for research, um, you know, feeling safe is a prerequisite uh, of the willingness to share one's story. So therefore, um, with those mothers who showed interest in participating in my study, I deliberately took the time to correspond via Facebook Messenger or email to help them feel more comfortable and gain, gain their trust. And before our interview or what would be our online real face-to-face -face meeting, uh, our first face-to-face -face meeting, I told them about myself, I shared my background um, as a social worker working with bereaved family, uh, I described my research uh, and I shared with them that I am too um, had stillbirth years ago and lost a baby boy. So after we form an initial bond, we could overcome uh, the challenges that exist when first meeting online and then transforming face-to-face -face meeting. All interviews took place via Skype, obviously, because I'm in Tel Aviv and they were in North America. Uh, overall, for my analysis, I had material from eight interviews and 80 written testimonials and stories. In terms of the IRB approval uh, and issues of con the confidentiality, there was no issue given that interviewees have provided their informed consent and the online material was collected from public online sources, uh, which is important because I only look at public um, Facebook groups. So if it was personal group or closed group, I wouldn't be able to use the material or, or even to lurk or be inside of it um, without asking for permission. Um, and many the posts 
uh, didn't include mother's full name anyway. So in which case, in, in that case, the anonym, anonymity was um, maintained. So because both papers uh, were both about uh, grief and baby's commemoration, uh, I decided together with the mothers to include both the mothers and their dead baby's full name uh, to honor their baby's memory and their mother's generous donation. So they are mentioned both in the findings sections of the two papers from the study and also uh, they appear in the um, paper's acknowledgement. So I, I just, I did a screenshot from one of my papers and this is the finding section so you can see. Now, a little about, uh, about the theories that I used. So my approach to analyzing the data was both deductive and inductive. So I integrated theories from several different disciplines, um, theories um, of motivations to philanthropic giving, specifically theories about altruism, a little bit about solidarity here also, but altruism in donation, prenatal attachment, uh, theory, which is a theory that talks about how, um, how a mother is attached to her baby even before she is pregnant. So basically she, she has visions and dreams about her future baby, she stops taking birth control, she changes her diet, and she starts takes, um, taking vitamins, etc. So even before the pregnancy, mother starts having a psychological relationship with her imaginary or imagined baby. Uh, in addition, I use theories of grief rituals. Um, the combination of all these theories from these different disciplines uh, helped me build um, my theory and my uh, my notion about um, milk donation as a way of meaning making uh, in loss. Uh, so a little bit about the findings. Uh, so what did I find uh, in terms of donor identity? Uh, donor identity serves as a transformative identity. Sorry, uh, in the um, in this women's process of coping with their loss, um, the fact that they were taking on a temporary identity uh, as a milk donor identity um, because you know you only lactate for a very short period of time so you can it's not a donation that you can do you know like like blood donation that you can do throughout your life so this temporary identity helped them um, reconstruct uh, their shattered identities as mothers as healthy females and and also um, I put here, I don't want to go into it, but you can see that that also I'm talking about the social discourse uh, about um, female um, maternal roles. You know, so basically, like in in the United States, for in, for example, you have all these baby showers, and like when a woman is pregnant, it's like a big celebration, and you know, it's very public. Everybody is about you know her belly and about you know her being a mother soon, and then when a when, a, um, when she suffers from a stillbirth or, or her baby dies, the discourse is like that, that you're not talking about it anymore. So I, I also have this part that I'm addressing it in my, in my work, that being a transitional, that being a milk donor and also help them integrate those aspects. And, and, and yeah, so you can read about that. So what else? I'll just give you an example. So one of the mothers said, so this is an example of how the, um, the donor identity helps, you know, in the process of transforming all the shatters identities and, and build a new identity of a baby. So the mother said, I decided to donate my breast milk for several reasons. For me, lactation is part of birth. Another part of birth is bringing home a baby. But in this case, that part was missing. So giving my milk gave me an opportunity to fill that confusing gap with some. Okay. No. Sorry. So in the second study, I uncovered the ritualistic attributes of the extraction and donation process. And the bereaved mother, um, so basically I found or I I showed how um Milk donation is a grief ritual, and I'm looking at it also from a um, personal grief ritual, um, grief ritual of the couple between the husband and the wife, and 
and then later on I will talk about the um, community uh, ritualistic aspects. But in terms of the personal grief ritual of the mother, so pumping and donating is a repetitive behavior, as we know that ritual ritual is usually a, around it has has repetitive behaviors. Uh, there are symbolic sanctity of the milk and other subjects. So the milk is associated with the baby and it has all the meaning about the baby. And also we have the smell and the touch and, you know, of the, of the milk and when it's like a little warm. And especially for the mothers who lost their babies after he nursed, um, like, like we saw baby Shane was 40 days uh, old when he died. So the ritual is, 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 you know, also using you know, all the senses of the mothers. Uh, also, mothers find, uh, find meanings uh, in the donation process itself and all kinds of meanings like my baby is a savior and my baby died to save other babies. Uh, I'm saving other babies. Uh, he, uh, his very short life had purpose, things like this. And, um, and also the identity change. Also, uh, the bereaved mothers experiences the ambiguous loss which means that physically the baby uh, is dead and is physically absent, but the milk is there and all the postpartum symptoms um, are there too. So mothers experience the combination of the physical absence and the psychological presence of the baby. So in my paper, I demonstrate how the process of extracting and donating the milk creates a grief ritual that allowing the mothers to maintain uh, and reconstruct continuing bonds with their babies, which means that, so it's not that the baby just disappeared from her life and the pregnancy gone and everything is just, you know, it's not a cut. Like she has, um, through, um, through the donation and through extracting the milk, she can somehow make the connection with the baby longer. Uh, she can gradually decide when she stops um, lactating and let go. Of the milk, uh, and the last, um, the last milk donation is also in some way the last farewell from the baby. But this time, it's from her choice, and it's not that it's something that just happened and she had no control over it. Okay. So, oh. um, as an extension of the ritualistic aspect of milk donation, uh, I now have the privilege to collaborate with Tanya. Uh, in a study in which we use visual data analysis and digital ethnography uh, to learn about the meaning of public commemoration and public honoring of bereaved mothers' milk bank. Um, so it's a work in progress, and we collect uh, visual, we collect at this stage um, images um, of the um, commemorate of the memorial walls that uh, from 13 different milk banks. Um, I don't know if we have enough time for it, but basically um, each mother who donates milk in memory of her baby gets either a leaf or a star. And this is like the only way that the mother in terms of identities, um, that they, it's a place that knows her for being a mother for a baby that other people don't know that was even exist because if she lost the boy, uh, in stillbirth, let's say in 26 or 27 weeks, um, just uh, of being pregnant, then nobody knows that she had him or, or that he had a name. Or you know, when she goes to the you know, to the playground or to the uh, school with other kids, they only know her as the mother of those kids who are working with her. Then nobody knows her about you know as a mother to the baby that she lost. But here in the milk bank, through those milk walls, you know, the memorial walls. Then, then they know her also in that aspect. And just the last uh, picture. So here, this is Kristen, uh, whom I interviewed uh, in my study, and she lost um, two babies in a row. Um, and twice she was a um, milk donor. And here you can see her next to the memorial wall. Um, so to summarize and to go back to our theme of today's meeting, qualitative research that matters. So the experiences of stillbirth and baby's death is a subject that um, is silenced in many cultures and societies. And I believe that by uncovering those experiences, uh, we help, help make those mothers' voices heard uh, and we contribute to changing the discourse around prenatal death and we help promote um, the knowledge about the importance of milk donation in general 
uh, and vascular loss in particular. And sharing the research process for me uh, with the bereaved mothers, it was very um, emotional and very meaningful. Um, I think I, I learned a lot, not just about doing research, um, well, we don't have time for it, but but I'm just I'm just I think that um, it is so empowering also for them um, to be able to read their own stories and think about it and reflect on it, and then to be able to to make a dialogue dialogue about it, and and it's it's like a continuing of of reconstruction a reconstruction of the experience because you never leave your dead behind you like we keep going with our dead and we keep going with and we keep reframing the stories and the narratives and our relationship with our dead so i think the specific experience with you know corresponding back and forth with them about the stories um was a privilege to me to 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 be part of this kind of um process that each family uh, went through um, because they participated in this research. So um, anyway, um, it was a pleasure uh, being here today. And thank you so much and good luck with all your work. This is my thank you slide. Bye bye, good day. Okay, back to you, Tanya. Okay, great. Aliette, you can take maybe your mute off so that you can answer some questions and that'll be great. So, so it's really wonderful uh, your being able here uh, to be here to talk about these stories. And as people have pointed out, this is very moving information and emotional, um, but also enlightening because the systematic way you looked at these things and gave opportunities for this information to be part of a larger community, I think is very important as well. Um, so I want to ask you my first immediate question, because this was your PhD, which was in the States again. And so once again, most of the mothers who contributed to your project were American, weren't they? And uh, so in terms of international, because you're in Israel, and I know you've continued to do work in Israel, um, can you maybe comment on some of the characteristics of thinking of this more internationally? Or like we know this is clearly not something that's just happening in the United States, it happens out all over the world, but uh, it's it there are cultural differences about things and i wondered if you could comment on that at least from your perspective in israel what a question um let me think so so i think there are several things that that you need to keep in mind when you try to transfer one things to another culture so specifically in israel there is the issue about um First of all, the, the donation itself. So we only opened the milk bank here in 2020. So it's not it's not very common. Most of the milk sharing is through the online um, media. Um, and also um, the approach, because, because it's a new thing, then uh, hospitals and, and medical uh, personnel, they are not familiar with, with those issues. It's like doing it's like an underground women's secrecies that you know where they're switching between themselves milk and everything but the doctors that i i talk to they don't really know that it exists or or if they do know they really ref like they don't want to take part of it so i i interviewed a few doctors that they said that they would never suggest to a woman who lost a baby in miscarriage or in or in stillbirth to to start you know pumping and lactate, they, they will immediately give her pills to dry her milk. Um, so it's a very uh, male-oriented kind of thinking, although those are, there were female doctors that I spoke with, but it's very conservative. And also the issues of religiosity is important. Uh, I think um, because in Judaism, 
um, until a certain stage of miscarriage or stillbirth, then the baby is not even, it's not that you're, it's not that you are taking him to a graveyard and you do a ceremony or, or you have a farewell. For, you know, so from certain week, when you lose a baby, they just take it somewhere. You don't even get to say, you know, you say goodbye, but this is it. You sign a paper and they put him like in a grave that it's with, with other parts of bodies from. So I think um, when I'm thinking about grief ritual, then it's it's very much associated with, with more Christianity kind of from my sample. Like, so the, I had one Jewish family, but but they all talked about it, you know, going to church with the baby, taking pictures of the dead baby, dress him up. Um, so it's something that I, I think it's, it's something to keep in mind, like while well, the religious, the, the policies in the hospitals and the discourse within the society about it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. This is for like for my pop of my question, so. I was oh, thinking my, my, um, yeah. your point about symbolic sanctity of the milk might also be relevant in terms of that to those religious differentiations as well, because yeah. we know obviously in Islamic kinship characteristics that would have a different feature. Yeah. That, um, so, uh, and in places like Israel where you have competing visions, it would be part of thinking about this too. So like yeah. trying to find ways to think about it together. <laughs> so. Yeah, I actually now uh, I am I supervise I have a master students that she's a Arab, she's a she Muslims uh, Arab, and we try to she she tries to do a, a research about the uh, milk donation within the Islamic community in Israel, and people really you know they don't want to participate. So again, it's like how do you build the you know the 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 story or the narrative about milk donation she she gets very hostile uh, responses saying like how can you how can you even suggest or think about uh, milk donation and i keep telling her you know in iran they have like 28 milk banks and indonesia they have like other muslim country have milk banks and they they you know they manage so i think we can as well but it's something about the the larger narrative, I think, within the Israeli community, that it's it crossed the Muslims, the Jewish people, and the Christians. That is something that is like very, very new and very strange. So we have a lot of work to do. So I think probably so there's a lot of work, a lot of yeah, work we will. to do <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's wonderful. We'll leave it there and maybe take a. We're scheduled to take a brief break because I'm sure that people need to actually get a cup of coffee or take a break for a second. Uh, Justin has put, a, put up a wonderful coffee uh, image there. I wish I had these things. He's so great in terms of technical things. So we'll come back in about 10 minutes and we'll start again. Thank you so Thanks. much, Valia. Thank you all. We appreciate okay. it so much. Thanks Thank again. You.